Hi, and welcome to the first episode of Planet Zero. So look, I'm not going to mince words, but we're currently living in the biggest challenge that humanity has ever seen. We've overcome struggles that threaten cities, countries, and ideologies, but we have yet to overcome the climate crisis that is currently threatening the lives of every plant, animal, and human on this planet. The science is clear and irrefutable, with an overwhelming majority of independent scientists accepting it as fact. But we as a society, and especially America, have continued to ignore the facts and refuse to implement policies to address this issue. The fact of the matter is our current way of living, our daily actions, and our consumption are unsustainable. The fossil fuels that power our cities have led to the sharpest rise in atmospheric carbon dioxide ever seen in the last 800,000 years. The major issue here is that this carbon dioxide does an excellent job of keeping heat trapped in Earth's atmosphere. So as CO2 rises, so does the temperature. And we know that a difference of even one degree of warmth could mean the difference between this and that. So how do we get ourselves into this mess? What conditions occurred in so short a time to affect our entire planet's well-being? It all started in the year 10,000 BCE, where humanity began to cultivate crops for the first time. This was the beginning of civilization. And it all kind of went downhill from there. Okay, okay, fast forward about 12,000 years to the 19th century. During this time, Western Europe had just discovered that burning coal was a great, cheap way to power factories and provide cheap energy for industry. England, of all people, was notoriously eager to hop aboard this new way of making money because, you know, that's what England does best. Several decades later, an electricity started to pop up. Light bulbs, telegraph machines, radios, and fancy player pianos start to work their way into the lives of many Western countries. This created a demand for electricity to power all these devices. Like England, many people turned to coal, a fairly common source of fuel, because it was easier to transport and collect compared to wood. The issue was, and they didn't know it at the time, but burning fossil fuels, like coal, releases gases and was carbon dioxide. When coal is burned, its carbon that was previously buried away underground links up with oxygen in the air, creating carbon dioxide. This is an incredibly stable gas with lifespan of centuries in the atmosphere and works super well at keeping the atmosphere warm. The same thing applies to other fossil fuels like oil and natural gas. However, in the early 1900s, the industry was way smaller than it is today, and so no one noticed a difference aside from some air pollution. And so the burning continued, and continued, and continued. And then World War II happened. Suddenly, coal and oil were being burned furiously by millions of soldiers, powering boats, airplanes, tanks, and the factories that were churning out the weapons. And to the victors of that war went the spoils. A booming economy where everything in the world could be provided with easy access, the modern household began buying appliances in mass, new cars, boats, going on distant vacations, constantly buying new outfits, etc. And the global CO2 shot way, way up. This area we're talking about now is called the Age of Acceleration, and it wasn't just energy demand that skyrocketed. As population grew exponentially, so did the demand for water, fertilizer, and transportation bringing with it a huge increase in atmospheric methane, nitrous oxide, and ozone, among many other things driven by economic growth. It wasn't until 1958 that someone realized there was a problem. On the top of Mauna Loa, Hawaii, this guy named Charles Keeling began to measure atmospheric CO2, and he realized that there was a sharply increasing trend in a gas that should only noticeably vary seasonally. He was the first person to see that carbon dioxide levels were increasing, and by the looks of things, it wasn't going to be pretty. After a lot more research and scientific consensus on the facts of climate change, governments began to take some action on environmental regulation. In the US, Richard Nixon founded the Environmental Protection Agency. The Department of Energy began to monitor carbon dioxide effects. And so a summit meeting was held in 1980 between scientists, fossil fuel executives, and politicians to try to come up with some proposals to fix the issue at hand. At this point, scientists had already determined that if CO2 levels continued to rise at their normal rates, that there would be a global heating of 3 degrees Celsius at some point in the next 100 years. This heating, however, wouldn't be seen for another couple of decades, and so they collectively decided to kick the can down the road, a worry for another day. And then this guy got elected. 1980 saw the rise of conservative climate change denial in the United States. Up until this point, many politicians believed climate change was a real threat and the only question was how soon it would come. 
However, Reagan saw climate-based regulations as a threat to his free market economics. He made plans to close the Department of Energy, increase coal production, deregulate all American mining, and appointed anti-regulation believers to the EPA. It was so anti-environmental that many Republicans didn't even take his side. As the years passed without any sort of environmental regulation, signs began to show that climate change had already begun. Severe heat waves and droughts were starting to break records across the country, especially in 1988. Streets in New York were melting, areas in the Midwest were consistently above 100 degrees, and Yellowstone Park caught fire, affecting 35% of the park. Things were getting dire, so an international summit was held in Noordwijk, Netherlands, to agree to a treaty proposed by the Dutch to limit carbon emissions. Nearly all countries were ready to sign it, until American delegates convinced the group not to freeze emissions and just agree that there might be a problem. Nice. Today, at least in America, we have not seen any meaningful change in our carbon emissions. Another international agreement, the Paris Climate Accord, was drafted to keep global heating below 2 degrees Celsius. Thanks to this guy, we now join the list of countries that are not part of this agreement, along with Syria and Nicaragua. As of November this year, we will be officially removed, and the president has already demonstrated that he intends to continue this process of deregulation. So here we are today. With a steady rise in carbon dioxide that the world has known about for decades, and yet still has not taken serious action to combat. Yes, there are better success stories elsewhere, and yes, we are taking some action to curb carbon dioxide emissions. But we're acting as if the consequences are still decades away when we're seeing them today. The best way to help is to first, accept that this is real. It's really happening. And second, is to accept that this is a crisis that governments around the globe need to treat as they would any other crisis. Society has the power to go completely carbon neutral. It's just a matter of getting there. In our next episode, we'll be going more in depth as to how carbon dioxide, among other gases, have been heating up our atmosphere and how this is not something that Earth has ever seen before. Join the discussion in the comment section below. You know, keep it respectful, please. Please. And make sure to like and subscribe to support Planet Zero. Okay, bye.